Well, hello again, everyone. It's really good to be with you once again, and I hope this finds you well. Well, I wonder if any of you have watched the feature length documentary, Hearing is Believing. I've got a picture of the DVD here, and this movie is about the true story of a lady called Rachel Flowers. She is a woman who was born 15 weeks premature, and as a result, she lost her eyesight and became blind even before she reached her expected due date. So before she would have been born, if she hadn't been premature, she was already blind. Rachel has a remarkable talent. From the age of two, she has been able to play every song that she heard by ear. And that even included complicated pieces like the Bach fugues. She started learning classical piano at the age of four, and she discovered jazz, one of her biggest loves, at age nine. And today she plays many instruments, including classical flute, guitar, bass, saxophone, and harp. And she has a flourishing career as a musician and recording artist. If you look her up on YouTube, you'll see some of her beautiful music. She writes, records, sings, um, and... Um, her music is really special. She has truly a remarkable gift. And it's, it's a great story of how God has blessed her with astonishing talent in her hearing after that she lost complete use of her eyes. Well, you've probably also noticed that the title of my sermon this morning happens to be the same title, Hearing is Believing, because I borrowed that title from Rachel's movie, uh, and it fits beautifully with this week's reading from Romans. The passage can be found in Romans chapter 10, and while the whole reading covers verses 5 to 15, I'd like to begin by skipping to the first part of verse 14, which goes like this. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in, and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Hearing is believing. Because as Paul writes here, how can you believe in Jesus if someone hasn't shared him with you, if you haven't heard about him? Verse 14 is a very missional verse. In fact, the whole of Romans chapter 10 is a very missional chapter. It's one of the most missional parts of the whole Bible. So anyway, let's go back to the beginning of Romans 10 and read the whole thing through before we take a closer look at what Paul has to say to his fellow Jews and also to us. Romans 10, chapter, verses 5 to 15. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring Good news. I love that scripture. 
So since we started on a musical theme, I would like to continue with one, because in his commentary on Romans 10, the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, who also calls himself Tom Wright, uses a musical analogy to help us understand what Paul is trying to communicate to his Jewish readers here. He compares Romans 10 with a musical work by the great English composer Edward Elgar. It's a piece you might have heard of. It's called The Enigma Variations. Tom Wright says that the passage we are looking at this morning is like The Enigma Variations because the chapter is like a set of variations on a theme. And this is how Tom puts it in his own words, and I'll put the quote up for you. He says, part of the enjoyment of listening to a set of variations is discovering within the original melody hints of something new, which the variations can then bring out. Many musicians have produced delightful works by this means, and many writers have done the same. This, in fact, is what Paul is doing in Romans 10. Recognising this and working out what he's up to is the only way to unravel what otherwise remains quite a dense and daunting bit of theology. And I do recommend this book to you, Romans for Everyone. We as a denomination have been reading through um, the book of Romans together recently and, and I bought this book because of that. And it's a very interesting and well thought through book. But what Tom Wright is saying here, um, and what he says in his book, is that the main tune that Paul is working with in Romans 10 is Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're all very familiar with that chapter. It's a spectacular passage full of promise and life. It talks about what will happen to the Israelites after they reject the Lord their God. It's a prophecy. And after the Israelites have been defeated in battle and have lost the promised land to pagan invaders, it tells what will happen next. After they've been taken into captivity and scattered among all the nations, And it talks of a time when they finally will turn back to God to obey him with all their heart and with all their soul. So let's have a quick look at Deuteronomy 30. We'll start in verses 3 to 6. And let's remind ourselves of God's faithful promise to the Israelites after their rejection of him has brought down calamity on their heads. Deuteronomy 30 verses 3 to 6. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. So this is the main tune Paul is using the theme of the transformation and salvation of Israel from the curses that came as a result of their rejection of God. He's using Deuteronomy as his main theme, Deuteronomy 30, because he is aware of some variations on the tune, some different ideas or interpretations of that passage that were going around at that time. One of these was the thought that in order for Israel to be saved, they needed to get the true wisdom, which nobody can find by going up to heaven or descending into the sea. No matter where they look, 
they can't find it. This wisdom could only be given to Israel by God. And the other strange idea going around at that time was a thought that a collection of special laws would be given by God to Israel and would then be observed in the temple in Jerusalem. These special laws would be the true marks of God's covenant people. They would be the badge that would set Israel apart and save them at the final judgment. And Paul is very well aware of these variations on the theme, but they're not in harmony with the main tune. In fact, they are discordant. Because the very heart of Deuteronomy 30 is not some special wisdom that you had to seek out or a special set of instructions that had to be followed. It is the Messiah. It is Jesus himself. And that's why there is a problem with how Paul's fellow Jews have interpreted the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 30. And in fact, there are three problems. Let's look at them. Problem one, salvation doesn't come from some thing special. It comes from some one special. Salvation doesn't come from something special. It comes from someone special. You see, the salvation of Israel could not come about by special wisdom or a special set of laws, but only through the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. Let's look at verses 11 to 14 in Deuteronomy 30. Now, what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you, or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may obey it. To paraphrase, God is saying through Moses, what you guys need is not far away or difficult to find. You don't have to go to extraordinary lengths to get it. It's very near. It's the word of God. And that's why Paul writes what he writes in Romans 10 verses 6. And seven. Let's take a look. He says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. Then he adds his own thought, that is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? And again, Paul adds his comment, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. He's making a direct quote from Deuteronomy 30, only he is adding his own spin on it to make a point, a crystal clear point. You don't have to go up into heaven to get a special something. And anyway, it's not a special something. It's a special someone. It's the Messiah. And he has already come down to you. And you don't have to go down into the depths because the Messiah has already been raised from the dead. He is the word of God. And he is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart. Second problem with how some of Paul's fellow Jews were interpreting Deuteronomy 30. This salvation is not just for Israel, it is for all peoples. The salvation spoken about here is not just for Israel, it is for all peoples. The Gentiles are welcome into this covenant family and they are welcomed on equal terms with the Jews. So salvation has a new badge of honour, whereas before physical circumcision was how God's people were set apart. Now salvation is marked out by a spiritual version of circumcision called here 
circumcision of the heart. And get this, it is now being made available to everyone. As Paul states in verse 12 of Romans 10, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. And then in verse 13, we see Paul quoting from a different part of Scripture. He quotes directly from Joel 2.32. And I've put both verses side by side, Joel 2.32 and Romans 10.13, for comparison. For everyone calls on the name of the Lord, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what Paul says in Romans 10.13. In Joel 2.32, pretty much identical words. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now Paul, Paul's use of the term the Lord here is quite contentious. He's using the term Yahweh, meaning the Lord of the Old Testament. And he's doing that because he wants to get a message across to his fellow Jews that Jesus is the personal embodiment of the God they know, the Lord of the Old Testament. Big revelation here. Now let's look at the third problem Paul has with how some of these Jews were interpreting Deuteronomy 30. Problem three, salvation doesn't come through works, only by faith. He's saying your works, your attempted obedience of the law, they won't save you. There's only one way to be saved and you are going to find this difficult to swallow. Romans 10 verse 8. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's as simple as that. When you confess that Jesus is Lord with your mouth and you believe that God raised him from the dead in your heart, you're agreeing with what God has done in Jesus Christ. You're agreeing that salvation is a gracious gift. It can't be earned. And you're putting your full trust in that work of grace, you are confessing, and that means agreeing with, the reality that righteousness has now been secured in the death and resurrection of our Lord and Saviour. And you are not just saying the words, you are believing them, meaning you are trusting in his work of salvation and not your own work. Tom Wright puts it like this. The strange cryptic promises which spoke of the final undoing of the curse of exile have come true in Jesus. He is God's fresh gift of grace, like the original law, but in a completely new mode. This is Paul's own variation on the theme of Deuteronomy chapter 30. So let's turn back to Romans 10 and verses 10 to 11. For it is with your heart that you believed and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Who is the him that Paul refers to? Well, here he is quoting from another part of scripture. I'm sure if you look it up in your Bible, there will be a footnote telling you this. He's quoting directly from Isaiah 28, verse 16. So let's read what that whole verse says. And I'm gonna show you um, this passage in the New International Reader's Version. I think it's very clear in how it's put here. Isaiah 28, 16. Look, I am laying a stone in Zion. It is a stone that has been tested, 
It is the most important stone for a firm foundation. The one who depends on that stone will never be shaken. And that's the bit that Paul quotes. So who is the hymn that Paul refers to? It is, of course, none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the firm foundation of our faith. And with Jesus Christ at the heart of our salvation, full harmony is restored, which brings us back to those beautiful verses at the end of Romans 10 that I read out at the start of this message. Let's read them again, verses 13 to 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Verse 13. This is still such an exciting message. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. And despite what some people say, it is still a hugely relevant message today. Verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? When Paul wrote the book of Romans, Jesus was a new idea to the Jews and Gentiles of his time. But that was 2,000 years ago. Nowadays, the Western world is very familiar with the name of Jesus. And you could say the Western world is tired of hearing of it. We're told that we live in a post Christian world, that the world has moved on from Jesus Christ, that nobody wants to know about Jesus anymore. And the strategies that churches have used or been using to make disciples just aren't as effective as they once were. So maybe we should try and do things differently. I want to show you this quote from a man called Alan Hirsch, who I learned about when I did the GCS Missional Living course earlier this year. Alan Hirsch is a thought leader in the missional church movement. And he says this, the future of the church in the West will be determined by our missional imagination. We've got to start thinking outside of the box. If the things that we used to do don't work anymore, we need to develop other strategies that do work. We can't simply keep on doing the same thing that hasn't been working in the hope that this time it will somehow magically start working again. But I believe that in the world today, people still need Jesus every bit as much as they've always done, maybe more. Because there are more broken homes, more abused children, more lonely elderly people, more people who are hurting and unhappy. And these people, whether they know it or not, desperately need Jesus Christ. So how can we tell them about him? As the title of this message says, hearing is believing. So how can we make ourselves heard? How can we make them hear? Well, I think we need to change. I'm not just talking about GCI, but all churches in the West, all churches who exist in this post-Christian culture. We need to change the way we do things. We need to be less inward looking and become more outwardly focused. We need to understand that mission isn't a program that churches do. It's the way we have to be. It's in our DNA. The church does not have a mission. The mission 
has a church. I've been reading this book by John Rittner, and John Rittner was one of the keynote speakers at our recent GCI Global Conference in North Charlotte that took place in July. I'll show you the book. It's called Positively Irritating. A few years ago, after working in the ministry in America for 15 years, John and his wife moved to Europe to try and learn how to do mission in a post-Christian world. They were smart. They could see the way the direction of traffic was going. They understood that what was happening in Europe now would be happening in America very soon. And they wanted to be ready for when that time came. So before I finish today, I would like to leave you with a few of the things that they have learned on their journey. Maybe it'll pique some interest in you. Maybe it'll get you thinking about it. Maybe it'll spark a conversation in your, in your congregation, in your local area. And the first thing that I want to share is this. In a post-Christian culture, a church building is not a place people are comfortable visiting because many have never even been in one. And in his book, Rittner describes how he and his wife tried tactics in Europe that worked for them in their home country. They would get to know somebody. They would build a relationship with them. And when the time was right, they would invite them to come to their church. And in America, that works. But in Brussels, where they moved to, it, it, it had the completely opposite effect. Rittner writes, in our first few months in Brussels, we met dozens of people. We met parents at our kids' school. We met friends at the gym. We met locals in the corner pub. We met neighbours in our apartment built building. And at the appropriate moment, after creating a genuine friendship, we invited them to join us for our church service. Most thanked us for the offer. And while not one of them ever said yes, I think we heard all of the polite ways people know how to say no. I like the way he put that. And in all the time they were in Europe, not one single person became a Christian as a result of being invited to come to church because none of them came. So how then did John and Kristen make disciples? And that brings me to point two. In a post-Christian culture, you have to build relationships by going out to meet people where they are. I'll read that again. In a post-Christian culture, you have to build relationships by going out to meet people where they are. And after trial and error, John and Kristen learned that you have to build relationships by going out into the world and meet people where they are. And this is a biblical mo model. Let me read what Rittner wrote about this. He said that scripture reveals God as a sending God. God the Father sent his Son. The Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit. And now the Father, Son and Spirit are sending the church into the world. Jesus' church is a sent people a community of faith propelled out into the world by the grace and love of God to be a blessing to others. I'm going to give you a quote from someone else that's referenced in John Rittner's book. He's a guy called Bradley Briscoe and he wrote a book called Acting Like Missionaries and this chimes with what I've just been saying. He says, we often wrongly assume that the primary activity of God is in the church. Instead, the primary activity of God is in the world. And the church is an instrument created by God to be sent into the world to participate in what he is already doing. And the third insight I would like to share with you 
I don't want to overwhelm you with stuff. And I apologize for all these quotes, but hopefully you can go back and look at them um, and revisit them. So the third insight is this. In a post-Christian culture, we need to learn how to become disciple-making people. Again, to quote from Rittler's book, he says, we must invest more resources in developing God's people so we all know how to effectively make disciples in our day-to-day lives. It needs to become natural, as natural as living and breathing. Those who have rejected institutional church need to see Jesus incarnated in the lives of his people as we flesh out the kingdom in the everyday spaces of life, the places where we live, work and play and create. We must stop merely inviting the world to church and instead be the church for the world. One more quote from Rittler's book, and we are done. And this one is from a man that he references by the name of Kim Hammond. Kim is the author of a book called Sentness. I haven't read the book, but I really like the sentiment behind these words. He says, church people think about how to get people into the church. Kingdom people think about how to get the church into the world. Church people worry that the world might change the church. Kingdom people work to see the church changing the world. We all understand that the church is not a building. The church is a group of people. And our people are our most valuable resource. So as we restructure our church in the UK, for the future, for growth, we want to prioritise developing our people, helping one another to become disciple makers who join our Heavenly Father in his work of redeeming this fallen world. Helping, as Kim just read, or I read from Kim's quote, helping us to change from church people into kingdom people, sharing the good news about Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us that you are ascending God, who sent your Son so that everyone who calls on his name might be saved. And then you, Father and Son, sent your Holy Spirit. And now, Father, Son and Spirit, you are sending the church out into the world to be a blessing to others. Help us to learn how to be effective disciple makers and join you in your business of redeeming a fallen world. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today. And just a reminder that this coming Wednesday evening at 7.30pm, Jackie and I will be hosting our national men's and women's prayer meetings on Zoom. And you can find the link for that on our website, www.gracecom.church. And of course, there will be another service here on YouTube at the same time next Sunday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.